Okay, back with part two. There is more stuff that I want to complain about with this book. So on page 169, uh, Christopher Hitchens says, The New Testament is itself a highly dubious source. One of Professor Bart Ehrman's more astonishing findings is that the account of Jesus' resurrection in the Gospel of Mark was only added many years later. Now, this is wrong on so many levels, so let, let's get into this. What he's referring to is if you open your Bible and you go to the Mark 16, the, the final chapter in the Gospel of Mark, uh, after verse 9, there'll be a little footnote in the Bible, which will say uh, verses 9 to 20 were added later. Uh, so the, the, this is interesting, and this maybe is something that Christians don't talk about enough, is that the ending to the Gospel of Mark that we have in our Bibles now was not originally part of the Gospel of Mark. But the resurrection is still in the Gospel of Mark. The, the way that the Mark ended, the way that it originally ended, the women are going up to see Jesus, uh, to, sorry, to, to see Jesus' body after he's been crucified. They get to the tomb and the body's not in the tomb. And there's a young man, uh, according to the Gospel of Mark, it's just a young man, it's not an angel or anything. There's a young man sitting in the tomb and the young man says, oh, you're looking for Jesus. He's not here. He's been resurrected. Uh, go and tell the disciples. And then the, the woman ran away and they didn't tell anyone. And, and that's how the gospel ends. So, in the gospel of Mark, even in the original ending, it's still very clear that Jesus has risen from the dead and that there's an empty tomb there. We don't actually see Jesus appear like we do in the other Gospels, at least not in Mark the way it originally ended. So, uh, you know, the, the, in the original Mark, there's no Jesus appearing to the disciples and performing miracles with the disciples and saying, okay, Thomas touched the, the holes in my hand or, or something like that. Uh, we just have the empty tomb and the young man says he's been raised from the dead and then the woman run off. So that, that, that's the first problem with it, is he's, he's, he's messed that up. Uh, there is still a resurrection account in the Gospel of Mark. But the other thing is one of Professor Bart Ehrman's more astonishing findings. So he's crediting this to Bart Ehrman, but this is not one of Bart Ehrman's findings. I don't know for how many centuries this has been known. Um, but it, this, this is not something Bart Ehrman discovered. If you go to any Bible anywhere, in, including Bibles published 50 years ago, th there will be a footnote saying uh, the, uh, verses 9 to 20 were added later. This, this, this isn't something that Bart Ehrman discovered. Bart Ehrman has written about it, but Bart, Bart, it's not one of Bart Ehrman's findings. Now, Bart Bert uh talked about this actually in, in a number of different places, um, but uh, I, I'm thinking the, the most prominent place he talked about it was in his book, Jesus Interrupted. So I'm relatively sure that this is where Christopher Hitchens got it from. And if you read Jesus Interrupted, Bart Ehrman is crystal clear on this. Uh, there, he, there, I don't know how Christopher Hitchens got the impression from Bart Ehrman that Jesus was, there was no resurrection in the Gospel of Mark, unless he was not reading Bart Ehrman carefully, um, which, which apparently is, yeah, apparently is what happened. Um, I'm a little bit hesitant to make accusations about Christopher Hitchens being drunk when he was doing his research because that's a cheap shot g given that it was public knowledge that Christopher Hitchens had a drinking, pro drinking problem and would often drink when writing. But yeah, you, you've got to wonder, was he drunk when he was doing the research for this book? Because how else could he have gotten that so wrong? Uh, he, you know, he, he's got his source, he's got Bart Ehrman, but he's got it completely 
completely backwards. And if you read Bart Ehrman, and you know, Bart Ehrman is not like this scholar. Well, I mean, he is a scholar, but it's not like he writes in, in this really confusing academic jargon or something like that. Jesus Interrupted is not a scholarly work. It's, it's, it's written for a popular audience, and it is... It, it, it's not hard to understand. Um, and, and similarly with the other places Bart Ehrman has talked about this, uh, every place I've heard him talk about this, the, the, it, it's, it's, it's not confusing. So, yeah, I, I don't know what is going on with Hitchens and his research. Um, but... I, I think I think this does beg the question, though. I mean, once once you stumble upon a couple howlers like that, how credible really is this book? Uh, I was just on Wikipedia before I filmed this video, and uh, apparently critics have picked its accuracy apart. Uh, and people who are more knowledgeable than me have caught things that I wouldn't have caught. Uh, but it sounds like there was just all sorts of errors all the way through it. So, certainly after I noticed as many errors as I did with the New Testament section, uh, then, then, you know, I got to the Islamic section where he's kind of doing the same thing, where he's kind of talking about the Quran and the history of Islam. And I read that with a skeptical eye because I thought, okay, if he's, he, if he's gotten this much wrong about Christian scholarship, really easy basic things that he should not have gotten wrong, if, if there was any care at all going into this book, then, then, then how credible is the Islamic section going to be? I, I don't know anything about Islam. You, you know, Christianity is my background. That, that's what I know about. I don't know anything about Islam, but I, I am guessing that the scholarship on Islam uh, or Christopher Hitchens' recounting of the scholarship on Islam was just as sloppy as his recounting of the stuff on Christianity, because why wouldn't it be? You know, once he's shown that he clearly can't do research and he clearly cannot get basic facts straight in a, in a book that, w that was published by a major publisher and so widely distributed and talked about, why? Okay, maybe Christopher Hitchens a drunk and he can't get his facts straight, but why? why didn't anybody... In, in the publishing house, I, I, I don't really know how publishing houses work, but um, my, my understanding is that they have some sort of fact-checking that usually goes into their books. A apparently, I guess they just thought, okay, Christopher Hitchens, he's a big enough name, just slap, slap a cover on this and sell it. Uh, there, there, some of the arguments that he makes in one chapter are repeated in another chapter, which, which is an indication of sloppy proofreading uh, and that the publishers just didn't care and nobody was going over it. And, and, and it, again, you know, this for, for a book that had its biggest cultural impact uh, as this one did and for sold as many copies as this one did, you know, more care should have gone into it. It's... it's I, I, I'm upset about it. Uh, I, I, I don't think it's excusable. And, and there are more. There, there's stuff I didn't even mention. Some, some of it's minor, some of it's not. He, he talks about uh, all the lives that were lost debating which gospels should be in, uh, included in the Bible. I, I mean, he's got half a point here uh, since... The heretics were burned, but uh, n not, not in the debate about what to include in the biblical canon. That came from a later period. Uh, in, in another part, he said, um, There is scarcely a word in any of the later assembled Gospels to suggest that Jesus wanted to be the founder of a church. And that's wrong. Uh, I'm... <sighs> Possibly the historical Jesus did not want to start a church. I mean, I mean, you know, the, not not the Jesus that's in the Gospels, but the Jesus that actually existed in history. Uh, and it looks like Paul, from the seven authentic letters we have of Paul, did not want to start a church. But Jesus, as he is presented in the Gospels, definitely wanted to start a church. Uh, Blessed are you, uh, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. Uh, straight from the Bible. So, the, you know, and, and that's 
there's probably an anachron anachronism. Uh, that's probably something that later Christian writers put into the Gospels that was probably not with the historical Jesus, is, is my understanding of the scholarship. But it, it, it is in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's, it's in the Synoptic Gospels. So to say that there's scarcely a word in the later symboled Gospels to suggest that Jesus wanted to be a founder of a church, he, he, he's, he's getting... He's getting his facts all muddled up. He, he gets the dates wrong on uh, w when uh, Quirinius had the census. He said it was six years after Jesus was born. Um, but the, the census was in 6 AD. Jesus was born, uh, according to what we know from the Gospels, either in 4 BC or 6 BC. So that's 12 years. I mean, that's, that's a nitpick, but there, there are all these mistakes all the way through, uh, and it just... Well, I, I, I don't know what, what else to say. Uh, it's, it shouldn't have happened. It should have been fact-checked. Uh, and it, it seriously undermines the credibility of the book. Um, and I, I, I think it's, it's safe to assume, based on what he wrote about Christianity, that the section on Islam isn't going to be accurate either. Okay, I'm still angry about that, but I'm going to move on. Uh, talking about the Iraq War. So, Christopher Hitchens was notable in his life for being a contrarian, even though he would have rejected that label. Um, he, he, he made both sides upset. Uh, he, he was a notable leftist most of his life who changed sides to support the Iraq war uh, and then got all the leftists upset and became the darling of the conservatives uh, until he published this book, which, uh, you know, in, in the U.S., conservative and religious is pretty much synonymous. Synonymous. Uh, and so, so then this book got the... Uh, conservatives upset at him. Um, so he, he's, he's been going back and forth on this, but he's still hanging on to this thing about the Iraq war. And he's upset that the church spoke out against the Iraq war. Uh, quoting from page 40 of his book, he says, as the debate over intervention in Iraq became more heated, positive torrents of nonsense poured from the pulpits. Most churches opposed the effort to remove Saddam Hussein, and the Pope disgraced himself utterly by issuing a personal invitation to the wanted war criminal Tariz Aziz, a man responsible for the state murder of children. So he's, he's I, I mean, I think most people, most reasonable people would see the fact that the church is trying to stop a war, that the church is opposing a war, as a, as a positive development in Christianity. And the problematic thing about Christianity is that we haven't had this stuff sooner, that for most of history, the church has not been opposing wars. And in fact, in often cases, the church has been supporting wars. Christopher Hitchens sometimes takes that as a negative. But then, in the very same paragraph, he goes on to say, on the other side of the confessional span, some, but not all, American evangelicals thundered joyously about the prospect of winning the Muslim world for Jesus. So he's upset with the Christians who opposed the war, and he's upset with the Christians who supported the war. Uh, I, I mean, I don't know how Christians could ever win with this guy here. Uh, he's... He, he's upset that the religious right hijacked the war. Uh, it's something that he often will say in, in the videos as well, if, if you watch this video debate. But that was incredibly predictable. Uh, I mean, of, of course they were going to try and turn it into the, a religious war. We, we were never going to have this war in, against Iraq without that religious dimension getting into it, which Christopher Hitchens should have known when he supported that war. Uh, So, I, I, I think it's hypocritical on, of him to, on the one hand, condemn the church for supporting wars and violence throughout history, which he does. 
And to the other hand, condemn the church for not support, supporting the Iraq war. Um, yeah, wh wh what else do I want to get into on this book? Uh, actually, that may be my more serious complaints. Um, I want to talk about maybe some of the stuff I agreed with, because uh, I, I, did, I did agree with a lot of the book. Um, I thought his writings on the Old Testament, in which he condemned uh, the barbaric tone of the Old Testament, were very powerful. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this review, his, his rhetoric can be very powerful at times. Um, so, uh, one of the things which... He's borrowing this from Thomas Paine, but I, I think it comes through well in his book, nonetheless. He's talking about a passage in the Old Testament in the book of Numbers. Numbers 31, 15 to 18. And I'll, 